Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me once again is my co-host, Pervez Ahmed. Hey, welcome back, listeners. Good to have you guys back. We're pretty excited uh, about our guest. Uh, we've actually been in talks for quite some time. Wanting the to negotiations have been, have been ongoing. <laughs> that's right? right, that's right. So, uh, and a little bit of cross-pollination, as we'll see, uh, when we read, when we read uh, who, who the guest is, and he'll talk about some of his ventures. All right, well, and, and joining us for this episode is Baraka Blue. He's a poet, musician, author, teacher, and MC. He's highly decorated within the global artist community for his original synthesis of hip-hop and spoken word poetry with the tradition of mystical poets such as Rumi and Hafez. He has released multiple studio albums and two published collections of poetry. He's founding director of Rumi Center for Spirituality and the Arts, and for his research on Sufi thought, Baraka Blue was awarded a master's degree in Islamic studies from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. His current research and teaching focuses are Sufi poetry, Sufi psychology, Islam in the West, and Islamic art. As a teaching artist, he's performed and taught all over the world, including at such institutions as Princeton and the School of Oriental and African Studies. Baraka Blue, thank you for joining us on Peace and Congrats. Thank you for having me. So, this is, you know, your, your, your work precedes you. Uh, Mashallah, you've built up quite a, a reputation for your work in this particular field. So I guess before we even talk about your artistic endeavors, uh, I want to hear about your Islamic endeavors and how those came about. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's a great honor. You guys are like the original podcasters. <laughs> before I even knew what a podcast was, you guys had a podcast. Wow. And so now that I've been diving into the podcast world, I see you guys as my... You guys are like the Salaf. <laughs> you guys are the predecessors. predecessors. So, uh, would that make you a Salafi then? <laughs> I am, I am, I am. <laughs> right. And uh, but yeah, forty-eight. You guys are that's mashallah. Mm. So, yeah, my journey into Islam was an interesting one. Um, Amir Suleiman, my friend, he has a Harvard fellowship, and he called it between Rakim and Rumi. Mm. Um, so very musical city, you know, Jimi Hendrix, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Quincy Jones, all that. But by the time I came on the c growing up, yeah. it was all hip hop, right? Urban right. America was all hip hop. So I was very much formed by hip hop and the kind of local scene was really beautiful in that it was a lot of consciousness. It was a lot of telling the stories of marginalized peoples, peoples who, you know, basically like Freestyle Fellowship had an album called Inner City Griots. Mm -hmm. And like, that's what I think about that, that kind of like real hip hop, the inner city griots and griots or the bards in Europe, you know, traditional societies, the poets or the storytellers, they're the memory, the living memory. That's right. And they pass on the tradition and they, you know, ha carry on a collective consciousness who are we as a people what are the stories what do we value what is worth sharing and worth saving and so hip-hop had that and so i kind of grew up in that and it exposed me to right previous previously enslaved and colonized people and how they preserve their stories and how they preserve their traditions and that was really f formational for me mm -hmm. um so that's kind of the rakim piece hmm. of it and because hip-hop i know you guys know a lot of people outside of the hip-hop community uh don't necessarily know so much how like central islam has been Absolutely. as a thread throughout hip-hop from the very beginning as far as like you know the five percenters especially as this kind of offshoot of the nation of islam and the, the foundational language and 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 terminology and just worldview of hip-hop being formed by that so, and then, of course, also Sunni Muslims um, figuring into that. So that's that piece. But then at the same time, you know, it was like multicultural, urban, very, right, left coast. Yeah. Very left, very like the Bay Area, Seattle is, of right? Of course. Super mm -hmm. leftist politics, mm -hmm. counterculture, very, you know, into Eastern spirituality. And looking back now, I see that um, my parents' generation and the parents of all my friends growing up, very, you know, urban, multicultural, liberal environment, mm -hmm. they, a lot of them had turned East for spirituality. A lot of them had, you know, so 
you know, become Buddhists or traveled the world or went to India seeking a guru, that whole kind of movement. Mm -hmm. And so it was just as easy to find books by the Dalai Lama or Rumi in the houses that I was growing up in as it is to find the Bible. Mm. You know what I mean? And so that's where Rumi comes in. So, um, you know, I was exposed to at the about the same time as I read auto, uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X, which I read because all my heroes, the rappers, he was their hero. That's right. So I want to know who he was. At the same time, you know, my best friend's father, who was like an old school beat poet, um, and he was like, "That's cool, you guys are into hip hop and you're making that." But he he was like, "Let me expose you to some of this." So he turned us on to Rumi and stuff like that because mm. he he was really into Rumi and he was in you know jazz and all that whole that whole thing. So looking, I didn't even understand at the time, but there's these two kind of currents, mm-hmm. right? That the the kind of like that black Muslim current and then the kind of more more like white. Um, turning east for spirituality, that counterculture, leftist politics, right. and Sufism is a big portion of that. Right. I mean, it's more dominant, like that people would, you know, get into like Indian spirituality, yoga, and gurus, and Vedanta, and then Buddhism, obviously, was central. But Sufism was a big part of that too, okay. and so that was kind of part of that whole milieu. And so the metaphysical bookstore down the street had a big Sufism section and all that stuff. So I was reading about Sufism. It, you know, Pyrenaid Khan and stuff like that mm-hmm. when I was young and yeah. a teenager. Um, and so looking back now, I can say that I was reading about Buddhism. I was interested in all that. But what I liked about Islam is it had the edge of like a Malcolm. It mm-hmm. had the social justice emphasis, emphasis, standing up for the rights of the poor and oppressed and the downtrodden. But it had the deep spiritual universe as well. Mm -hmm. And I needed something that had a a little bit of edge, you know, just from the way that I grew up. That's right. But that also I needed something that was spiritually enriching. And so to see that the breadth that Islam has, you know, a Malcolm and a Rumi, this is the same tradition. I said, okay, this is for me. Mm -hmm. So did you... uh did you grow up in a, I mean, I think you maybe already have sort of answered it, but you, you didn't grow up really connected to a church, say. No. Or a church attendance. No, was not at all. The, family. the only time I went to church was when I would s- spend the night on Saturday night at my, one of my best friend, David Falcon's house, because his family went to church. Mm. So then, you know, for a period there, I would go because there was this girl uh, that I liked and she would go to church. So I was like, I'm coming with you. <laughs> but um, so now I know. But I didn't know before that my father, he grew up Catholic. My mother grew up Protestant. Okay. And so my father went to Catholic school growing up. Mm-hmm. And he had a really negative experience. The mm-hmm. nuns were super harsh and beating the kids. And it was very, like, dogmatic. Our way is the only way, the true way. Right? right? I know no Islamic schools are like that. Right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But we now, can't relate. Right. We don't know what you're talking about. So yeah. that was his experience. Yeah. And so... He never said anything negative about religion to me, but my mom told me later, you know, a few years ago, that he actually told her, he said, I don't want them being exposed Uh, to religion. I want them to make their own decision as they grow up. Because my mom's Protestant, you know, upbringing was very loose, like Easter and Christmas. And she had positive. She said, oh, look, I want to take them for the holidays. And my dad was like, he was opposed to that. Mm. You know, which is interesting but he never said anything negative about religion or the church to us, which he didn't color it like, oh, that's a yeah. bunch of, you know. So right. I'm actually very grateful. That's right. Because I, I think a lot of people carry a lot of baggage from their upbringing. In fact, I was at a retreat uh, with Kabir Helminski recently, and there was a woman who grew up Christian, I think Catholic, and she became Muslim through Sufism. Mm-hmm. And she said, you know, um, we were raised like hardcore Catholic. And I had so many bad experiences that I just needed a clean break. And mm-hmm. Islam was a tradition that I didn't have all that baggage with. Right. You know, I know other people may have had like that, yeah. that upbringing, but I didn't. So I was able to approach it with a clean slate. Right. And I thought that was interesting because, you know, I basically, when I came of age as like a teenager, I approached religion like a buffet. Mm-hmm. Like I was like, oh, I like yoga. I like 
me- meditation. Mm-hmm. I like, you know, some of these like uh, indigenous shamanic traditions because I like psychedelics and I like smoking herb, and that's kind of part of that. So I'll be, you know, I'll, be, I'll weave that in, yeah. and I'm really into like ancient Egyptian. That's really cool. So, you know, what I, mean? yeah. I was just totally, yeah. um, and that was okay for a while, but there came a point where I realized that it was kind of my nafs choosing what it chose and so that huh. my nafs wasn't being transformed by it because the nafs resist transformation so I actually wow. needed something from beyond me to submit to mm-hmm. I re- realized that when I was 20 years old and it was because I started I had made a series of not so spiritual and wise decisions and I, I got myself in a little bit of trouble and so then I was like whoa yeah. you know for the first time in my life I was not uh not only not not arrogant, but I was not even proud of, of who I was. I had mm. made some decisions that, I, you know, my kind of ego was shattered for a second there. And it was the most important, I think, experience because I was able to, like, be sincere and say, okay, um, because this is the thing. From my reading of different traditions, I came to this position where I was like, there is one source, yeah. creator, God, you know, infinite names, the infinitely yeah. named one. Right. <laughs> and there's across time and space individuals, you know, the the enlightened one, the sages, the saints, the prophets, the avatars, those who realize the full potential of hum- humanity, who drew near to that right. that source. And there's you know, so I looked at religion kind of like they're all essentially the same. Right. There's beautiful. There's beauty in them, but. Basically, when, when I was 20 and I came to this point, I was like, okay, I, I said a prayer, like, really, like, I don't see a way, I made a few very bad mm. decisions, and I don't see a way out of this, like, mm. this is going to alter my life in ways that I really don't want to have happen, and so then I prayed my first, like, really sincere prayer, like a, a man on a drowning ship, mm. like, all right, there's no way I can turn anymore, mm. so now I'm, like, really just praying, and I was like, you know, I was like, I've always believed I said to to a lot to God. I've always believed in you. I've known that, that you are true, and I've taken some steps on the right path, and I've also veered left and I veered right. But if you take this tribulation away from me, I, I promise I'll devote myself to the straight path. And even if you don't take the tribulation away, I still will because you can't make contingent prayers. Right. Oh God, if you give me a Ferrari, I'll be righteous. Like no. <laughs> You know, give me the fright, please. But if if not, I'll still be righteous because that's and so well, interestingly enough, thinking back, I was saying the Fatiha in English, yeah. like wow. you know, you know, that's so right. That's right. Really like, wow. and I was interesting enough. I know the room that I was in the apartment complex, wow. and I was praying towards Mecca on my knees, even though I didn't know. Wow. And so I was in this, you know, I was in a space where we, I was with a group, young group of brothers that I grew up with, and we were exposed to all these traditions, different races, classes, yeah. backgrounds, reading a lot of leftist uh, material, but also spirituality. We had a whole library. We all kind of lived together in this place. You know, um, we were like selling music and marijuana to pay the rent. Like we were kind of like these very rebel against society and like, th- you know, there's a lot of good, but we were also intoxicated most of the time. Mm-hmm. And we were having like, it was just a lot of imbalance. It was good, but it was all mixed in. And so I kind of came to this breaking point where I was like, I need to really dedicate myself to, to, to the creator of existence, you know? And, um, you know, basically through that, like, I didn't even know that was Islam at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. But a few things came into my life and I saw that it was, you know, so. So like, it's interesting. I think at the outset you identified those two streams, right? Mm-hmm. You have the like the hip hop black Muslim stream of Islam in America, and then this. Um, I, I think we haven't really delved into it a lot in the show, but probably like you said, countercultural, counter counterculture, leftist, white mysticism, right? Sufi mm-hmm. orientation. But maybe what's maybe if we were to look at say the lowest common denominator between the two of them or, or identifying trait is that it's spirituality or uh, motifs or aspects of the, of the religion without doctrine. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, what spoke to me about Rumi, for instance, was 
his emphasis on the like experiential knowledge of God. Okay. You know, personal, you know what I mean? Like, right. Right. Um, and I think a lot of people that embrace Islam, that's one thing that's drawn to. There's like this emphasis on no intermediary bef- between you and that's God. That's right. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, and I think in a certain sense, it's like one time I was in the UK and I was with uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Rad. First time I met him. And I said, um, he asked me how I became Muslim. And I said, well, you know, it's funny. I never thought I'd be part of an organized religion. And he said, well, it's not that organized. <laughs> 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 and like... Of course, it was this dry British humor, but That's right. I felt there was two levels to it. Because on the first level, yes, unfortunately, we're kind of disorganized. We have some work to do. Yeah. But also, when Western people think organized religion and what that means in the history of Europe, it means there's this church authority, this temporal yeah. hierarchy saying that we represent the word of God that's right. and who's in and who's out. And that's what the West rejects ultimately. And right. that's this whole thing. And Islam wasn't like that. That's right. It never was. Right. You know, the ulama were never a priestly class. Mm-hmm. You know, they, in some manifestations, you could say they became like that in certain ways. But that's right. in, the, in the true sense of the word, the ulama, or really the knowers, mm-hmm. the learned ones, they're just individual seekers that took the path seriously enough to delve into it and to master the tradition and to preserve it. And it became this 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 vast conversation of 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 you know what is best, what does the divine want, what is the true prophetic inheritance, yeah. and there's very few things where there's only one answer. Right. You know, there's right. this this vastness, and so plurality, of- and even locally, there were different you know different authority authorities in different localities, and it was very wide. Yeah. And so I think. Um, that's something that, mashallah, um, is, is beautiful about yeah. Islam. Actually. Right. I mean, the, the people always say, why can't you excommunicate, uh, bin Laden? Right. Mm-hmm. Like, but so that's like the negative side is you can't excommunicate anyone, right. but that's like a small, you know, that's the, the benefit far outweighs that is that yeah. it's oh, this right. vast. So path. the benefits of a decentralized mm-hmm. approach. Right to orthodoxy. Because, because my were. point is, uh, what I really truly believe is like temporal power mixed with religion is always a very dangerous thing, and mm. you see it happening all over the Muslim world right now. Yeah, is the way that scholars are being used by different nation states to fulfill their agenda, and it's causing the people in many of these nation states to lose hope in religion and lose hope in scholarship altogether. And you right. saw the way it played out in the Arab Spring. Yeah, and. Yeah. There's no way to avoid it because the the draw of the kind of worldly thing is is very strong and you know power corrupts mm-hmm. and so it needs to be and and the kind of the scholarship the the religious authority if, if per se and the the temporal authority split very early in the Islamic tradition and I think that's a beautiful thing yeah right right so at like the the ulama as being sort of in conscious opposition to the state Mm -hmm. as opposed to being part of the state apparatus. Mm -hmm. Although you you certainly did have those elements as well, but by and large, it was in conscious opposition to the state or to keep the state in check. Right. Or to counsel them. Yeah. Or to counsel them. Right. 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 That's the other option, but it's never to, you know, be sort of usurped or yeah, to be used by state authority. And of course in practice that was, you know, that, you know, we already know the world is the world, but that's right. That's the idea. Right. So when do you sort of consider then your, like, like, is there a moment that you would classify as, okay, that's when I took my shahada? As yeah, I took my shahada when I was 20 years old. Mm-hmm. And, um, and this was when? What, what year? Yeah. Uh, 2005. Is that right? Okay. Mm-hmm. So, okay, so like, I was, my late teens, right, so like, I was in high school, 9-11 happened, and then after I graduated, then I'm making music, and it's very like leftist political music. And, uh, essentially, um, we were performing at like anti-war rallies, right? 2003, the Iraq war is yeah, going on right. and, and very active in that sense. That's right. You know, so, um, and like hip hop and everything and reading Rumi and Malcolm at the same time is still in your streams. I was so I mean, far still in your outside blood, of the streams. Well. Like, it, yeah. you know, oh, so, yeah. so you're, so it's two, so 2005, you take the Shahada, but even before then you've been moving in that direction. You said in 2003, you were, 
uh, uh, involved in activism as it pertains to the Iraq War. Yeah, so, yeah, when I graduated high school, um, my parents, well, basically, we I'd been making music, so I'd been performing with a group of friends that I grew up with, and we kind of were, like, well-known around Seattle, mm. you know, and um, it was, like... Mostly Even, hip hop, or yeah, it's all it was oh, hip hop. Okay, and you know it was like kind of politically leftist, but it was also like spiritual. Like you could see a lot of it was like seeking truth and meaning. What's life about and this and that. You know, just that you know kid trying to figure it out. Right. And um, but after I graduated high school, I didn't want to go to college. Like I had no interest. I was so like, I mean, Islam like brought me more into society. Like I was like so ready to grow my hair out and live in the woods and wow. grow ganja. Like I was like. <laughs> Babylon system, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like we were all on that so hard. Yeah. And so um like basically what happened is uh I went to the Rocky Mountains, there's a Buddhist school that was actually founded by uh Trumpa, who was a Tibetan Buddhist that came here mm-hmm. and then with a group of beat poets and people in those circles, they founded this school. Uh, and so I went and studied there for a wow. while because I was not that I ever like became Buddhist is, in the sense I wasn't interested in like becoming something for identity's sake. I was interested in like, you know, yeah. uh, drawing like fulfilling true human potential. Like we came here to know our true nature, so that's what I was interested in. So I went there for six months, and then the group that I was with, our album had dropped. And so around like the Northwest, we were getting all these gigs. So I was like, I dropped out and went back to like do music. So, and we were just like, uh, performing all around, you know, the city and it was growing and it was beautiful. Um, and then, yeah, this is, that's kind of how it happened. So it was like a, a really interesting time for me. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? There are so many inf- influences and, and that's why you see, like I was deeply spiritual, spiritually, yeah. um, driven, right. but also had this leftist thing. So like, you know, like uh, the, the kind of Buddhist, the Buddhism that I was ex- exposed to a lot of it was kind of like middle-class white, but then like the Islam in, looking back now, I didn't think of it at yeah, the time, yeah, yeah, but true. the fact that it had the edge and it was street and it was urban and mm-hmm. it was like really like, multi-ethnic and, and all these things but it also has this depth of the spiritual universe right um and like the straw that broke the camel's back was um uh i read um a work on ibn arabi mm. and then i was like what islam has this deep like phys- f- philosophical metaphysics yeah. like because i was a bit arrogant about organized religion that's what i'm trying to get at yeah, and then yeah, i yeah. saw like huh. you see what i'm saying right. because that's the thing that I think is really important for people to understand now is like in traditional societies, you saw the fruit of, of religion. Yeah. You saw the hujjah al Islam, right? The like Imam al-Ghazali, the yeah. proofs the of proofs Islam. Of because Islam. you saw illuminated people. You saw transformed. You saw saints and sages, people that their presence made you shake. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And modern people don't believe in that anymore. Yeah. And maybe at, at most they say once upon a time there was people like that. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But... I knew, you know, I was reading about people like that, you know, and, and so, but I never met anyone like that either. And, um, my point here is that like, when you look at the exterior of religion, you know, Western people, they're looking for the, the, you know, experiential knowledge. They want to be transformed. They want to, to, this is my experience. Yeah. They want to transcend the 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 ego identity yeah. right, right. And once you like kind of accept that that, yeah. that that this is a possibility and this is kind of at the essence of the mystical traditions of every religion yeah then it's like okay you know so kind of you could say right reading ibn arabi that's kind of like haqiqa right this is like the end goal of the path we have sharia yeah the outward and tariqa the inward and then haqiqa is the what it what it all leads to these Correct. esoteric realities um but because I'd never exper- like been in the presence of someone who realized the absolute reality like that, like the truths, mm-hmm. you know, I needed to understand where it led. 
to dedicate mm. myself to the first stages. Mm. Like once I f- saw, okay, this is the point. Mm-hmm. Now you can show me how to wash myself for prayer. Now mm-hmm. you can show me why <laughs> there, there should be a structure, why you should step into a room with your right foot and, and out of room with your left foot and all these minutia because I understood, oh, it's to stay in constant remembrance so that you can eventually can awaken, awaken, more from the dream right like inception a dream within a dream within a dream so you yeah. wake up out of that one out of that one and then boom yeah, yeah. you know what i mean that's right i got it like i could submit to the discipline because i understand there was a goal yeah. and i think most people even muslims unfortunately nowadays they don't really see islam as like there's a goal it's just that's an right. identity it's because that's so true you yeah. see what i'm saying and that's what we've lost right you know because for most of us who grew, who are born into the faith and grow up into the in the faith it's 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 the it's the exact opposite, right? right. We yeah. are introduced to Sharia, as it were, the doctrinal aspects of the faith, the minutia, as it were, uh, yeah, without absolutely. really seeing the end. Absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. right. And I mean, many times it's just like parents or teachers or whatever right. saying, "Do this, don't ask why." Right. So oh, if of course. you want, this so is very doctrinal, right? And you're yeah. not getting because, like, even if you, well, why do we pray? No. You know, sometimes people are like, "How dare you ask that?" Yeah, you know, of what I mean? course. And unfortunately, that kind of stifles that right. spirit that wants to know yeah. that could, that is. And curious. I think what you're touching on, and, and you know, we talked about this even with like the episode with Azhar, right? Which is like, if, if I think if Islam is going to grow and continue to grow, it, you know, and, and, and be, uh, what's the word? Not palatable, but, you know, mm-hmm. absorbed by Western audiences, it has to speak to that reality sure. of people who are searching for the truth, but they want to see kind of where is this all leading? Like, I get the minutia, but why? And you know what I mean? Like, cause, look, sure. I don't want to sign up to organized religion just for the sake of identity politics. For well, example. it's too, it's confusing that because if you go to world religions class at any yeah. good yeah. university, oh, yeah. you see beauty and truth in all these different oh, religions. Absolutely. And you see that, you know, especially if you start to read the mystical literature, you're saying essentially they're all realizing the same thing. This, you know, this oneness, this ego death where you're experiencing that, right. that we're all one ultimately. And that the source of being is one. And yeah. we're all, you know what I mean? So like it gets, it can get really confusing because if you're, if you're, you know, it's just like, well, what, what's going on? Like, what mm. the plurality? We're in. The point is, yeah. in a traditional society, you were just everyone was what you were, and then yeah, there was people right. that were righteous, not so righteous, good, not so good. Right. You know, but largely now, homogenous societies where yeah. now, like, your neighbor's a Sikh, and your neighbor's a Hindu, and your neighbor's a Christian, and a Mormon, yeah. and, and um, it's confusing. Yeah. Young mm. people growing up because it's just like, and so. A lot of people just opt out and say, oh, it's just all the same or whatever. Um, So then for you, what was it? What was that salient feature then that said, you know, if it came down to, okay, I've got option A here and I I, I don't need to characterize like this. Buddhism and you've got option B, Islam. Yeah, when I study the the mystical elements of it, you know, a lot of it seems the same. But what was that sort of salient feature that said, you know what, Islam... That's a really great question. So for me, it was like... um, on on one hand, yeah. it was that Islam affirms all that came before. Islam is very universal. I mean, the Quran itself is the is the scripture that speaks about other traditions more than any other scripture in him in, in world religion history, right? So, right. and it affirms them. Correct. It's one saying, of the names of the Quran and the Prophet, I believe, is Musaddiq. Mm. Right, that which affirms. Right, and so every nation right. was sent a prophet. Yeah. They all came with the same message. Mm-hmm. Yes, the outward form of that message may have been a little bit different. The Sharia may have been different yeah. at different times, but That's the right. message was always La ilaha illallah. There is no one but the one. Putting and, a name on it, the aqidah was the same, but, right. the, but the creed. Was and the because same. I came, you know, uh, I never once, for one second of my life, disbelieved in God, mm. and I never for one moment in my life disbelieved in the prophet Muhammad peace be upon him because I was like coming okay he was one of the enlightened masters too right? Right. you know what I mean right. like that's where I was coming yeah. from like it was of course. and I was clear to me you know that Jesus I love Jesus and it was clear to me that like I didn't really lo- like resonate with how I felt he was represented by mm. the Christians that I knew I didn't feel like they were embodying that but mm. I was like but clearly he was onto something mm. you know <laughs> um, you know it, it strikes me how you know, when we look at the moments of our existence that bring us to the right now, mm-hmm. your father saying, I don't want them to be pointed in one direction, nor do I want them to be 
told yeah. to, to be to be dissuaded. Yeah. yeah. And how that brought you to the point where you could say, I love Jesus and I love you. Yeah. yeah, I respect my dad a lot as I get older, you yeah. know, like that he um, you know, and it's it's deep, you know. Yeah. And I think about that. And he couldn't have known. He I mean, couldn't have known. Yeah. You know? And he's always supported me, by the way, in becoming Muslim and all that stuff. And That's... he's like, you know, he's like really cool with it. And so it's like, yeah. Um, but to back to your point. Yeah. Um, so I had on my podcast mo- recently, um, Philip Goldberg, I believe is his name. And he wrote a book called American Veda. Yeah. And in there, he's talking about the influence of Indian spirituality on the West. It's a great book. If you're interested, which I know we all are, right. <laughs> on an Eastern religion coming West, what works, what doesn't work, what becomes successful, what takes off, right. what you know, what is emphasized, what's de-emphasized, because right. it's really good history. But the thing about it that I really love about that book is he has a lot of really deep kind of reflection. So he says he has he says, look, religions fulfill these five functions, and he gives them the prefix trans. So it's like translation transmission, transaction. Mm. Those are the exoteric, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's transformation and transcendence. Transcendence. Okay. Uh So the outward three, right? Translation, it gives you a meaning, how to understand transaction, right? The the sacred law, right? And transmission, all the traditions, what to memorize, all these stuff. That's, that's very important. And, and, And then the inward right mm-hmm. transformation right of course there's just the moral transformation yeah, yeah. because but then there's also the kind of spiritual transformation oh, yeah. right. you know the caterpillar to a butterfly and then Beautiful. transcendence this idea of expanding the boundaries of ego identity or dissolving them all together and right. and experiencing the the oneness that is this whole affair and Beautiful. it's like you know the, here's the thing that, that and I've talked with um uh other people about this. I was visiting Vinny Ferraro, who I know has spoken oh, yeah. here. A yeah. beautiful brother. And we used to live, we're neighbors on the same street in Oakland. But he's, for those that don't know, he's a you know prominent Buddhist teacher yeah. in the West. And he mentioned to me that, think about this, right? Buddhism is so popular in the West. So many people mm-hmm. became Buddhists, right? I mean, Buddhist centers everywhere, right? Famous people, all type of people, right? There is literally zero interaction, next to zero interaction between the Buddhists that came, the Asian Buddhists, yeah, yeah. and the convert Buddhist community. They're oh, totally separate. Right? And the Asian Buddhist community, they have like temples, and then the, the convert, right? They created, they created these meditation centers. There's right. literally no overlap. Mm. Wow. And, and, and I thought about this deeply because the, the reason why is because there's different needs for different communities. So if you come from a foreign country and you want to preserve your traditions, your stories, your norms, your, your culture, your customs, that's totally understandable. Yeah. You know, I hate McDonald's. I would never eat McDonald's. The only time I ever kind of like, Oh, McDonald's is when I'm in a foreign country (laughs) in the Arab world. And I see McDonald's, I'm like, I'm home. Right. (laughs) It's like, I'm the most anti McDonald's person. But when I'm there, it's like, Oh, it reminds me. You see what I'm saying? There's something about, you just want to feel familiarity. Totally. And so I totally understand that. Mm -hmm. But those that are the Westerners that are turning East for spirituality, they, they're rejecting the dogma. They're rejecting the, the church structure of Judeo-Christianity because it's not fulfilling transcendence and transformation, not because it's not fulfilling the other thing. Yeah. You see what oh, I'm saying? Right. And gotcha. so you can't yeah. serve them by giving them, oh, we'll just substitute those for those. That's right. Yeah. And so this is what's... See, and, That's a lesson. And yeah. with, within That's Islam, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of like vibed out Sufis, in the Bay Area that have no relation to the the yeah. Muslim community, community children of per se. immigrant, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. That, that whole thing. There's no interaction. Yeah. And they're just like, like I went to the retreat with Kabir Hominsky uh, and, the, and the Threshold Society. It's really beautiful. You have people that have been Muslims for 40 years. Yeah. And they're just, you would ne- walking down the street, oh, Trader yeah. Joe's, you never yeah. see them, just your average right. gray-haired white man or That's woman. Right. And they're just like, they love Allah and they pray five times a day and they're doing well, it. I you know it. what I mean? Yeah. And, but they, their emphasis is different. Then if you go to That's a right. mosque, they wouldn't feel comfortable because the emphasis is different. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so... Because, I mean, so, I mean you, you mentioned Kabir Halminski's community. So, you know, prior to where, where is he now? He's in, 
Kentucky. Kentucky. Yeah. He used to be in Santa Cruz. Yep. So I visited the community in Santa Cruz, and I know exactly... I mean, I'm literally picturing people I met. Like you said, you bumping them in the supermarket. Wouldn't dream, fathom that they were Muslim, but yeah. deeply committed Muslims. Exactly. And that's a very unique and fascinating community. Right. And so you have that, yeah. right? That's the Rumi. And yeah. you have the, the black Muslim communities right. all over America that, you know, in many ways are totally separate also well, yeah. they're in their t- and it was interesting because you know I was like with these like vibed out OG white you know Sufi Muslims for this retreat and then after that I went and visited some like elders in the black Muslim community uh-huh. like the next day and it was interesting because it was like this is the same thing even though it's very different Okay. Right, and they're all kind of like love Allah, and they're mispronouncing their own Arabic names on both <laughs> sides. You know what I mean? And they're just like so they have their unique thing, but it, yeah. it fits in their. It has to be that way for right. their cultural context, right. Right? right? And so, like someone who comes from a Muslim heritage and comes to this country, they may look at that and be like, "This is weird. Like mm. it's not familiar." Right? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, but of course, you know. Uh, now what we're having is with the younger generation, we're having this, like we say, cross pollinization yeah, yeah. where you're having people from all these different yeah. backgrounds and really envisioning, okay, what does it mean and what is it going to look like? Here? Right. And we're also beginning to see, I mean, I know, cause I know also recently based, just based on social media, but mm-hmm. you also recently spent time with Dr. Omer, past mm-hmm. guest of the show. You have also the emergence of people like Dr. Omer, Sheikh Hamza, right here in the Bay Area, but Dr. Omer, mm-hmm. uh, you mentioned T.J. Winter, mm-hmm. but, you know, Dr. Abdul, you know, Abdul Haki Murad in, in UK, mm-hmm. but who kind of, they embody and they are straddling both sides. Right, They're Sherman all, Jackson, all, yeah, Sherman Jackson, Jackson. Jackson. Yeah, yeah, no, all just, these people, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, right. Exactly. And yeah. they're, yeah, and they are fully at home in multiple of these kind That's of worlds right. that we're talking That's about. That's right. You know. And so then for the young seeker, I mean, to have people like that where maybe 20 years ago they weren't there, certainly 40 years ago they weren't there, that's got to, that's going to spell a new, uh, point to a new kind of a tra- 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 trajectory within sure. the, the, the American Muslim community. And I think it speaks to yeah. the fact that, like, we have to be honest about, like, you know, there's different demographics. Some people, yeah. right, and it's totally fine. Like, they, what they really want is they want... A place where they can have the emphasis on the transaction, mm-hmm. transmission, uh, uh, and these like outward aspects of tradition. And some people like the only thing that's going to draw them mm. is is the transformation, the transcendence. The that's it. Part. And there, so we need to have different people and different centers that speak to these different things. Like, like some people might look, oh, it's a shame that like the Buddhists that came from Asia, their yeah. centers are sep- separate from these kind of like the American centers, but that's it's not it's okay you know it's what I mean okay. and even in traditionally Muslim lands you had different centers and different for different demographics you, know, you had the Zawiya yeah. or you had the Hanukkah that's or the Tekke or the Madrasa and you're the, absolutely right I mean the same people who would argue that would be the same people who would say that the mosque has to be the center of all communal life right. for Muslims and that's just not that hasn't been the case traditionally historically why should that be the case here in America right you know so yeah, sir. So, and, and I mean, here we are, and we recording a Tet Leaf, you know, yeah. kind of that, you know, kind of straddling all of that as well, um, it, you know. And, and you mentioned cross pollination, and I don't want to just tease the audience, but I mean, w- what also makes kind of this episode unique is that you know, having Barak on the sh- on the show, um, you do your own podcast, yeah. And I definitely want to talk about that because I mean, I, I, as someone who got turned on to it and started listening. Um, you know, uh, I, 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 it's been a great show to listen to. So why don't you maybe say a little bit about that, and we can come back to some of the other things yeah. we've been talking about. How did about. you? How did you come up with the idea? We already said he, the... he was inspired by us. Oh, yeah, you guys, <laughs> I <laughs> wanted to say it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you were can't get to... too much of a good thing, right? Yeah. Sorry, no, yeah, yeah. So it's called Path and Present. Path and Present. Yeah, yeah. check yeah. it out, guys. Yeah, yeah, and huh? you know the idea is really like, um, I because I'm a poet musician and stuff, I travel all over the world and I felt like I was having these amazing conversations with different people, teachers, academics, scholars, artists, poets, comedians, activists. And I would always be like, man, I wish I could share this Mm -hmm. this, this conversation with people back home because, you know, when I would turn on the TV or even on the internet feed, Mm -hmm. I would see like a lot of negative and like, I was like, this doesn't represent anything that I know to be Islam. And again, like, 
I wasn't just the for me path and present is more generally about spirituality and seeking truth and meaning in the present in the modern world right but because of my own path and my own practice it's gonna like emphasize islam and particularly like the sufi perspective within islam right and so but i want to have teachers from different traditions and i'm really interested in like you know like like people like Buddhist teachers and, and, and teachers from India, gurus, and like what they're doing yeah. and in the Christian tradition and Jewish mysticism and all these type of things. Yeah. Um, and then not just that, but like artists and stuff like that. So really, it's just like, I want to amplify the goodness. And I feel like now with these mediums where you, all you need is a little mic and a little laptop and you can have a conversation in a room and the entire universe can plug in <laughs> you know and it's extraordinary it's really a trip yeah. and what i like about because i started listening to some podcasts yeah. and what i really liked about it is the ones that i would listen to were just super like raw long form conversations yes. not edited like there wasn't even like a, a script yeah. it was just like human beings having real conversations and there happens to be a microphone right and like you in the news where it's so ridiculous you know you watch the news and they're like have like three people and they're like we're going to talk about a very serious issue that yeah. people have been fighting over for centuries now you have three seconds to talk about it. now you have three seconds and you have three <laughs> seconds go it's like yeah. what are we doing here yeah, exactly like, things are complex and you know in our kind of like um, soundbite world, somebody says one thing and you, it's amplified and it's like, no, that's, that's not how it works. Cause I feel like with social media, you know, a lot of the arguments and debates and, oh my God, and outrage. <laughs> it's like, if those people were to sit in a room and actually talk it out yeah. for an hour, um, they'd probably find they don't really disagree all that that's much. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, but right. the, the medium, you know, it, it, it it makes it so people are talking past each other. Yeah, so yeah. I just wanted to, to preserve that. And also like one of the kind of, I, I haven't really like my own personal intentions with it are to preserve some of the stories of the elders, Correct. you know, like there's That's us too. Like, I mean, in like, so many ways you're describing you our, the intentionality behind our show. Like tonight at Talif, yeah. it, you know, there's a, yeah, there's an event honoring Daniel Abdelhai Moore, mm -hmm. who's one of my mentors in my new book of poetry is dedicated to him. And he is from Oakland, California, a uh, prominent beat poet, you know, friends with Allen Ginsberg and that whole yeah. world, but younger, the younger generation. He was published by City Lights, major publisher of uh, beat oh, poetry yeah. oh, when yeah. he was 20 years old or something like wow. that. And then he was had the Floating Lotus Magic Opera House in Berkeley, very avant-garde theater, That's playwright, all this stuff. And then, you know... Uh, Abdul Qadir Sufi came as a deputy of one of the great Moroccan saints, uh, Sheikh Mohammed Ibn al Habib, who we re read his poems That's here right. all the That's time right. at Talib. He came and, and kind of like exposed them to Islam. And then they went to North Africa and met this, like, right, Hujjat al Islam, this luminous being, one of the greatest saints of the 20th century in North Africa, and just were totally transformed. And then, so he's like fully in this, in this beat poet tradition but also fully in the islamic literature yeah. tradition and you know on, in some ways he was just ahead of his time mm -hmm. people couldn't really appreciate what he was doing and you know i see him as like a predecessor because it's like now i'm able to essentially i'm doing what he's doing like in, in the next generation is like right, you are combining these things and now people are ready for it so i'm able to go all over the world and people love it and see what and appreciate mm -hmm. it but you know he was like more slept on in his life people didn't get it they were yeah. like it's what, what so that's right you know and he passed away a year ago yeah well, I have mercy on him so we're having an event here and his, his wife is going to be here and all the old kind of uh, you know people from that community yeah so these people are passing into the next yeah, realm they are and and they're they're part there are salaf they are there are senad and we need you know there's su such beauty in like we talk about the, the different traditions in America the counterculture and, the, and the, these different traditions you know, from the Walt Whitman's, the Ralph Waldo Emerson's, to the, you know, the Black Elk, to, you know, uh, Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, like, we need to understand, like, we have a, a lineage, like, we need to honor the great lineage of America. And there's also, you know, there's always been the freaking Donald Trumps and the, you know, those type right. of people who are the 
on the dark side, or you know, at least serving the dark on side. On the orange side. Right, on the orange <laughs> side. And, but that's it's, yeah. that's just life. So that's we need, life. you know, and I think huh. what's beautiful about, you know, like the black Muslims in general, obviously, is that they, because of the nature of white supremacy, that the, the great black heroes throughout history, almost all of them were kind of like freedom fighters by necessity just to exist, yeah. right? So they don't, so like the black Muslim heroes a lot of them aren't Muslim. It doesn't matter. They're still like righteous people that stood for truth, right? Yeah. Like Frederick Douglass is and, right. the, and, the, and the Rosa Parks is and the, you know, you, you Martin Luther King, yeah. Martin Luther King and Mar- Marcus Garvey's oh, and, yeah. and the Huey P. Newtons and all this, right? And so they're like fully at home and claiming these heroes as Muslims. And then, mm. of course, you have Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, yeah, yeah. you have a whole list of other people lesser known, That's right. right? But outside of that, right, um, I think as Muslims we need to embrace and study and really understand like Absolutely. who was Ralph Waldo Emerson. Yes. Right? He was called the America's philosopher mm-hmm. and he was reading Hafiz and Saadi and he was really influenced and he yeah. was like you know, this he w- and, and he was an amazing thinker and you know, a lot of these the transcendentalists they were also in a time like two hundred years ago and they were writing against slavery and stuff like that. There's these are heroes. Yeah. And they're you know, they it should be our heroes as well. Exactly. And then we're in that lineage. So we're these Barzakh beings. We're in between the liminal wow. space. Yeah, yeah. And we have to like you know, that's what I, we get from the people like Dr. Omar and Sherman Jackson, those people that are consciously thinking about these type of topics is like, exactly. we have to be intentional in like, what, what is, what is our heritage and what do we stand for? And, that's right. Uh, right. And what lineage are we in? That's right. I mean, certainly you've identified the macro, but I mean, in, in the micro sense, the limited capacity that we have, and we'll, what we try to do is to let, like, like Park has been talking about is like preserve their stories. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to do you our, know, to the best of our ability because they are passing. I mean, you know, of that same generation are people like Hakeem Archuleta, for example. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. someone who we've been, we've been trying to get on the show. Okay. Yeah, uh, we'll we will, inshallah. <laughs> and then, you know, we recently had Dr. Hassan Bagby. And there's just these giants. And we stand on the shoulders of giants. And so we have to acknowledge. Well, and, and acknowledge one thing that we've said a few times is the yeah. idea of illuminating this tapestry yeah, the, of, of American yeah. Muslim of the American Muslim experience and yeah. how far back it goes and how it, it it stretches in all these different directions you know I mean Dr. Bagby who we just talked to last yeah. week so it's very fresh in my memory but yeah. I mean yeah. you know he, he has this very unique experience that's emblematic of what I mean he, he came to Islam in what 69 yeah yeah 69 so I mean but, what it was like at that moment in time right at that but juncture. also like to, to, to your tapestry point you know he talks about Converted to Islam as a uh, as a as, as a biracial person. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And we've had Osama on the show, Osama Cannon. We've had Mustafa Davis mm-hmm. on the show, and then so we are weaving this tapestry. Yeah. And you know, for example, you know, uh, Ahmed Barka just mentioned. Well, you know, I, I Vinny, would, the only thing I would push back. Yeah. We're not weaving the tapestry. It's already there. <laughs> no, it's already there. That's we're right. just kind we're of just, hopefully you're pointing right. it out to you're, people. You're yeah. right. But you mentioned Vinny Ferrara. It's like we've had Mike on the show, Mike mm-hmm. Anderson. Mm-hmm. We've had Osama on the show. It's just like. So we we've almost without even name dropping Vinny talked about people who've inspired who've been inspired by him and so it's just this beautiful, I mean yeah like you said we're just kind of doing our doing our best to to just highlight these these, these people yeah it's a beautiful these luminaries meeting, man. it's a beautiful it and, and yeah. we, you know to talk back at the beginning we talked yes. about griots right I mean like yeah. um, and I listened to um, I listened to both podcasts with Azhar Usman of yours I really liked it the first one he just like went bro. Yeah. he went deep. <laughs> He was like the Melakut, the Jabaru. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah, was like, I was like, mashallah. And shout out to Azhar. And it's like, you know, um, but he said something in the most recent one that yeah. I really liked, and it really hit me. He said uh, something about comedians in American society being the new theologians or philosophers. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, because I've always said, I've always thought about this as like, I said artists in general, more generally, yeah. but comedians, and that's an amazing art form. Right. Because first of all, okay, spoken word poet is just you and a mic in the crowd. Same as a comedian. Yeah. But like, if you do a poet, people can be like, oh, I kind of like that. Okay, whatever. And that's fine. It's good. You do get on with your show. But if you tell a joke and it bombs, yeah, right. Like, there's no medium. There's no like middle. It's just you lost. Yeah. Yeah. You know. That's true. But anyway, like I see like the artists in general. Yeah. Because okay. We talk about most Americans, they've never met like an enlightened master. They may not even believe in that, right? Mm-hmm. Secular society. So, who fulfills that role? Yeah. And the last kind of people mm. who are seen as kind of magical 
or mystical or the ability to bring something amazing from the unseen and be the vessel of, of some creative power mm-hmm. are the artists. Are the artists? That's wow. right. Right? And see how artists are worshipped in our society. That's so true. Right? Musicians and people. Yeah. And I think it's it's there that you know, and often um, this is a problem because it's like, look, um, it's like if it, true artists know that anything good or beautiful that comes to them, it's a gift, mm-hmm. right? And if you start to believe b- believe your own hype, right, then you can kind of be destroyed by it. And a lot of artists meet very difficult ends. I think sure. it's too because much to bear it. because right. they're being like, you're this great saint. And it's like, well, may, maybe I am. And you start no, to I believe mean, it. And right. Elvis Presley contested, I mean, dealt mm-hmm. with that near the end of his mm-hmm. life, if you believe he, he died or whatever. But, right, right, <laughs> you know, right, right. Not some walking around Memphis somewhere. But, no, but out with Tupac. That's so right. right. <laughs> there you go. They're cutting but, a new record. But that, the, the, the lure of the audience, you know, and yeah. not having that anymore near the end of his life was something he really grappled with. But, but trip out, because yeah, I yeah. was talking to Brother Ali. Shout out to Brother Ali. Oh, absolutely. And he mentioned he went to the Kanye West um, show. And this was oh. right before Kanye kind of went AWOL and like on yeah. stage and kind of like. Right, right. right. And, 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 and Ali said something amazing. He said, yo, it was the weirdest show because it was so between artistic genius and like straight idolatry and ego mm. worship. Because like the show, first of all, like, you know, like everyone's on the ground, like, you know, you, it's full and there's, there's a, um, a stage elevated above. And, like, there's all these speakers on the ground. It's, like, reverberating the whole crowd, mm. right? And, like, this is, like, it reverberates and then it stops for, like, two hours. Just building people up. Like, when's he going to come? When's he going to come? Right? And so it's just, like... Oh, this is before he's even before out. Before he even... Show- so then he comes and he's suspended above them on a stage that moves. So he's just out of arm's reach and they're all reaching for him. And he doesn't interact with the crowd at all. He doesn't acknowledge that they're there. He just performs his song. And the stage like turns at angles and he's harnessed to the stage so he's like hanging off. Yeah. And he said it was like so avant-garde, like artistically yeah. brilliant, but brilliant. it was so s- nefsy. Nefs. It was so like I am this deity, right? Yeah. And like Yeezy and like this whole yeah. idea. Jesus. Yeah. Jesus, yeah. But and, and you know, he was like, but I, and, you know, and then he hit me when we were talking. I said, like, "You know, remind me of this line that Rumi has." Mm. He said, um, "Bayezid, Bestami, and and the Pharaoh, Pharaoh." Mm. Okay, Pharaoh said, "You know, Ana Rabbukum, like I am your Rub, I am your Lord, That's Most right. High, right. right?" Which is, and and this was his ultimately his fall from grace yeah, because exactly. he associated himself with the, the divine, mm-hmm. but. Uh, you know, people like Halaj and Bayezid Bistami, they said things like, I, know Ana al-ha. Al-ha. Yeah. I am the ultimate reality. Mm-hmm. So they were saying the same thing outwardly, but Rumi says something interesting. Yeah. He says, um, but when, when Pharaoh said it, he was calling, he was saying it from himself. Mm-hmm. And, and when, when Halaj and Bayezid said it, they were saying it from the absence of self. Right. They were, hmm. and so this yeah, is the wow. difference. They were calling to themselves. To themselves. Where you see, that's where it gets dark when you're calling to yourself. Mm. But when you're just a vessel that is calling to something beyond yourself, i.e., the divine, then, then that's true artistry. Mm. You know, because it's, then it's like, you know, if people praise you, you don't see yourself. If people say you're amazing, you don't see it as you. You say, this is a gift. Because true artists know, like, you can't write your greatest poem or your greatest joke or your greatest song or your greatest novel whenever you want. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's why people, you know, people that believe their own hype, they get, cr- they have that first hit. And then they're like, oh, my God, how am I going to come up with another one? Right? It becomes too much. You see what I'm saying? Pressure. Yeah. Because they think it's from them. They think it's from them. But, you know, I think, and that's why, I don't know. You know, just to wrap kind of the point that I think is also important is like the spiritual path should unleash creativity. I mean, look what when Islam went to the yeah. lands, it made these great poets in every language right. immediately. Right. Like, what is that? Right. And and now not not a lot of people, Muslims and non-Muslims, don't associate Islam with creativity That's actually. Right. And and, right. and so then, I guess we have to ask like. Are we really practicing the tradition properly? Because it should be unleashing creativity, unleashing, as, a, as yeah. opposed to stifling. It. As Dr. Jackson likes to put it, like uh, unleash our creative genius. Mm. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we want to have you read a selection from your book, but actually, before you do that, I we received a letter oh. at our at our email address diffusecongruence at gmail dot com, and I wanted to share it kind of with the panel here because I think this is somebody who's asking some questions that could benefit from both of your um so this is this is from chad 
And he says, uh, Zeki already knows me as Chad on Facebook, but I wanted to address both of you in no small part because I've listened to quite a few of your episodes, especially the ones involving converts coming from a Christian cultural background. So this isn't something I've been open about on social media, but maybe it won't be much of a surprise to Zeki if he's paid attention to the people I know on Facebook, but I've been interested in Islam as a path for myself for several years now, to the point you might say I, quote, semi-converted for a while, by which I mean I would attend the prayers regularly and read the Quran in English, though. Yeah. But I recently had to move from a diverse college town to a pretty conservative and uncosmopolitan area. There's an Islamic community in the area, and I will try to reach out to them, but part of my struggle is being a pretty socially progressive person, and frankly, it's been a bit difficult feeling comfortable with Islamic communities outside digital space because of it, even though I see no contradiction between my understanding of Islam and my political and social values. But beyond Islam, feeling comfortable with religious communities in general has always been a serious issue with me. Anyway, my point finally is I was wondering if you all could point me toward any resources for someone in my situation. Writings, blogs, folks you've interviewed in the past for me to contact, whatever, etc. It's been hard to get past my second guessing and fear that I'm just going through some delayed white kid rebellion. But I will say the beauty of the act of worship has drawn me in and the simplicity of Islam itself appeals to me in a way the excluding and convoluted metaphysics of Christianity never really did. Thank you, and I hope this wasn't too awkward. Chad. So. Wow. What's up, Chad? That was dope, man. Thank you, brother. Any thoughts? No, no, I want to <laughs> defer to you. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, um, I thought about this. It's like, Islam is two things. I mean, one yeah. is it's, it's your individual soul's relationship with your creator. And at the end of the day, we all stand in the divine presence on the day of rising. And we're held accountable for each breath in each moment in each action and word and deed um, and so it's intensely personal and intimate um, on the other hand so much of the, the deen is, is communal yeah. and we do things together we're encouraged to pray together we fast together right there's certain things that there's a cat is like you need to be part of hajj, hajj right? like yeah. all these the basics and um, you know I think in our time a lot of times community is lost and community is fractured and there's a whole lot of history about that but um, we really need to emphasize embodying sacred community which is really filled with love and really filled with that, that maxim of Rumi come, come wherever you are <laughs> you know, wanderer uh, uh, lover of leaving even if you've broken your vows a thousand times That's ours right. is not the caravan, caravan of despair, despair. <laughs> and this is the caravan of love and hope and anyone who is you know truly you know really walking the path of la ilaha illallah is a path as a person of, of of positivity and hope because it feels you like this whole affair is is beautiful mm -hmm. and it's, it's painful and tragic too but in the end it's beautiful like the whole affair is mm -hmm. you know and um but it can also often be lacking because sometimes you go to your Muslim space and you don't find the come come wherever you are right that's not the what the feeling it's definitely not the vibe um, yeah 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 and uh so I feel for I yeah. feel you yeah yeah I feel you and I'm I f I'm grateful that I did early on uh, find communities and brotherhood and, and teachers and, and elders many of the people you've had on your show you know from from Dr. Omar and people like Osama and, and what he's done with Talif and, and and you know people in the artist community especially as well um, in a time where people like music haram bidda kufr shirk all that stuff and I find all these like young Muslim <laughs> artists and musicians and I'm like whoa yeah. like we're in the studio and I'm used to in the studio people are like smoking blunts and drinking 40 ounces and they're like in the studio you know burning oud and making sujood and I'm like yes this is this is what I yeah. you know what I mean yeah wow. there's, so, there's an emergence of a cult of a, of a culture exactly and so um, it's out there and it's yeah. not everywhere yeah. um, but you know, may we be those people, may we be connected to those people, but an, inshallah, these podcasts can be, you know, I've listened to podcasts where, you know, I just get exposed to different people that are on there, and then that leads down another rabbit hole, and their, their books, or their music, or their comedy, or whatever, and I'm like, it just takes me on this thing where I just got exposed to a whole new universe of people, yeah. and, um, 
you know, that's at the best. That's what these tools can be. So that's right. Chad. Kind of like a virtual community. And and I mean, I, I would also tell Chad. I mean, well, one, you know, thank you for listening for sure. And and we hope that the guests that we've been able to bring on the show have been you know meaningful in the sense that people that you have listened to and benefited from. Um, I would also you know kind of echo what, what Barca just said in terms of you know even if you were to live in a place that did have community, let's say by numbers. Who's to say whether that would be a community that would be that prophetic community, which would be a community of love and welcome and and, and come as you are, you know? Um, and so, you know, so we don't where know. Would you, where would you point him? Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, shameless plug. I mean, I, I would say definitely go to <laughs> Talib Collective. Yeah, I would say go to talibcollective.org. Uh, a, lot of our, a lot of our communal, like a lot of the things that we do here, uh, whether it's in the Bay Area or in Chicago, we live stream it. We yeah. broadcast it. You can check out the broadcast. You can engage. Um, you know, I, I can facilitate a conversation you can have with Osama Cannon, mm-hmm. founding director, uh, people like Barca and others who, who were able to bring to uh, There's really leave. cool retreats here. Yeah, cool right. retreats. We do an annual newcomers retreat. Mm-hmm. Uh, we offer all kinds of classes and things like that as well for people, whether you're Muslim or just interested in Islam. So. Yeah. Uh, absolutely um, uh, do reach out and um, you can also ping me here at the show and I'd be happy to connect you with awesome. any people I can, anybody I can well with that in mind as we do wind towards our conclusion That's right. um, I was hoping Baraka that you could uh, share a selection from your writing with the audience Bismillah. So tell us a little bit about the book, if you could. So like this maybe book is... Uh, this is the book that is dedicated to yeah, the I'm, late I'm, Abu Haimor. It's called Empty in the Ra- Ocean, and it's... Uh, empty in the Ocean? And the Ocean. Mm-hmm. Empty in the Ocean. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's quite... It's uh, just a few months old, actually, so... Um, and people can buy this? Yeah, if you go to uh, my Facebook, Barker Blue Facebook, you, you'll find the link there. Great. Um, and, we'll, and we'll put the link up when we, when we post the show as well. For sure. Yeah, and if I could also, where can people find your fine uh, podcast? Yes, uh, the podcast is called Path and Present, um, and it is on iTunes yes. and it's on SoundCloud. Those are go. the two places. Um, yes, you should find it there, and I think you may enjoy some of them. I don't know what kind of vibe are you guys going for. Uh, you know, we'll let you we'll let you steer this ship into port. So. I think uh, this kind of uh, fits with what we've been talking about today. It's called Things That Can't Be Taught. And the the idea behind this poem is that as you get older, you know, I I kind of, you kind of probably came through. I was always kind of a rebel. I think that's just part of me. So a lot of times my parents or elders said, don't do this, but I usually did it. Um, And then I usually learned, oh, they were right. I shouldn't have done that. But I had to learn for myself, right? Don't touch the pot. Oh, yeah, it is hot. Yeah. It is hot. And there's certain things about experiential knowledge. Sometimes right. it's really it's really beautiful. You know, That's I heard right. one of the elders say who, who used to be a you know, heroin addict. And he said, um, a, a, uh, a religious person is somebody who doesn't want to go to hell. A spiritual person is someone who's been to hell and doesn't want to go back. Hmm. <laughs> and you know he was speaking yeah. from someone who's been to hell yeah, that's right and that's uh, right. you know this idea of in our tradition especially in the poetry you know the, the mystics always talk about how can you explain honey to one who's never tasted mm-hmm. and it's this idea that if if all of us together tried to explain what honey tasted to someone who had never tasted honey we would never succeed in a million years right Right. there's certain things that have to that's be right. tasted experience right. so, what we in the spiritual tradition call dhok that's right. it that's right yeah. and uh, that's Things that can't be taught. Mm. Things that can't be taught, like poetry and rhythm and moon sadness and sun dance on grass leaves dew, gratitude and death. I like what can't be taught but must be learned by anyone serious about living and serious about dying. Things which can't be chalked on boards or scribbled in notebooks but must be tucked beneath forms into back behind heart pockets by whoever does that anymore and always has. Everything dancing around the center, ablaze flames grotesque and sometimes subtle, sometimes too much to gaze upon, sometimes silent, sometimes siren song, 
taunting, taunting the living out of their life. Everyone dancing around the subject. No one says it. Everyone knows that no one knows it. No one knows that everyone knows it. <laughs> you can't be taught to burn. There is a single way to learn. The way that's always been only open. You can't be taught to smell the ocean. You must go yourself to the edge. What can't be taught but must be learned to die well. I live to know what can't be taught. Style and grace to feel, to be silent. Or rather, what silence means. You can't be taught to realize. You can't be taught to realize. Compassion can't be taught. You can be taught the motions, but sincerity cannot be bought. By a private education or through a taxpayer stipended underpaid government employee, what I learned in trap houses and mud huts can't be taught. In masjids and mushrooms can't be taught. What can't be taught to sailors to be amongst the waves must be learned in silence amidst the cold and early graves. What can't be taught is wisdom. What can't be taught is pain. Certainty certainly can't be taught if doubt would still remain. I can't be taught to love you I can't be taught to cry, and I can't be taught to stay here if I was born to die. <laughs> Thank you so much. I mean, I think if there's any doubt about artists being our new theologians, we'll yeah. put that to rest today. I mean, because you're, yeah, you're just great. You, you're like, you're, 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 you're talking about and grappling with things, I think, that even our greatest theologians sort of, you know, discussed and whether it was the Maturidis against the Motazila or whatever, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of how do we know things, uh, you know, the nature of goodness and the nature of evil and, you know, these were mm -hmm. things that... Experience yeah. and consciousness and awareness. Yeah, of. that's right, that's right. So, and I would say, too, so um, much, uh -huh. just in closing, you know, Please. that uh, one quote that I really love, Said Hussain Nasser said, art is the means by which the deepest truths of a religion are articulated to the masses. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Because yeah. very few people are going to read high-level works of theology or fiqh or, right. or, or, or philosophy or metaphysics. Mm -hmm. But in a traditional society, you know, the poems and the song and, the, and the, in some cases the dance and the yeah. architecture and even the clothing and the calligraphy and right. all these things allow us to actually experience yeah. those deep realities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know... We, we really need to emphasize and, and support the arts in that way because you know yeah. we have many great uh, conferences where it's like a hundred speakers and it may be great yeah. but then you have like one entertainer that's right, right? but it's like but we, we but what what are we missing about human psychology yeah. what what is it about humans that is really moved and transformed and inspired right. it's the you know what I mean yeah right. so but you guys are doing a great service, man. You guys are amplifying really beautiful conversations, so thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, my self, yeah. thank you. So, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on, and hopefully, we'll get to have you back on. And we'll, it's open before, door policy. Yeah, and before we let him go, though, uh, where can people find you online? And, and, and barakablue.com is my website, okay. and um, that should link you to all my social media, etc. Or if you're visiting a city nearby or yeah something. yeah right. and you're i like travel quite dates. a bit yeah. i'm on my way to southeast asia on, in a few days so um but i travel a lot so hopefully i'll be in a city near you yeah nice well and and as far as our show you can find us at uh, diffuse congruence at gmail.com if you want to email us and uh, thank you again chad for sending us that message and with that on behalf of my co-host Provez ahmed and our guest baraka blue my name is zaki hassan this has been diffuse congruence we'll catch you next time thanks for listening